Uh, my name is Patrick Combs, and I'm the Worldwide Technical Leader for Healthcare and Life Sciences at AWS, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, but essentially I am the pivot between a lot of our technical uh, resources in the field and our service teams and trying to understand the needs of the industry that we serve and uh, bring out appropriate services. And joining me today is Mithun Malik, who's one of our uh, solutions architects on the partner team and focuses directly on healthcare. And we also have Phil Christensen, who will be joining us uh, from LogicWorks to discuss some of the common issues that they find in, uh, in these, you know, archi when architecting for healthcare compliance. What we'd like to go over today is just a few things. So I'm gonna talk about the way we, we think about HIPAA on AWS and what essentially our shared responsibilities are. Mithin is gonna review a few common examples of how to uh, you know, really deal with you know, very uh, common architectures of the things that we see most often. And then uh, Phil will address some of the, the you know, common but vexing networking issues that they uh, see with a bunch of their customers. And just let's start off. We enable HIPAA compliance. We get a, I get the question a lot about how to do this, right, or whether or not we support it. Now, as I'm sure you're all aware, there is no pro forma HIPAA certification that can be issued, right? There is only a sort of posture that you can adopt relative to the requirements that are placed on you and your customers, which is to say that, you know, you have to follow the regulations as, as issued they are a bit vague, and so we're gonna go through a few of those just uh, real quickly up front here. We have a business associate agreement that's available. It is available in Artifact. So for those of you familiar who have direct access to uh, the accounts that you have, which have Artifact in them, um, you can access the BAA there. It can be signed from there and executed. The BAA contains, the, the uh, BAA in Artifact is the legalese. The rest of the BAA is sort of a living document to us. And so the services that are eligible for use uh, within HIPAA compliant architectures are on the web page for, for the you know, folks that aren't familiar. We maintain a web page that lists out all the compliant services. And you know, all the services you know, are meant to be across a broad range of applications from you know, really everything we've got, compute to networking, database and storage in between. So, we like to you know, highlight what we've been able to you know, really roll out in the past couple years. Now, for those of you who have been working with AWS for a long time, will probably recognize that a few years ago, about two years ago, we only had about 16 services that were eligible. And this was a constraint for a lot of customers who were trying to do really interesting things and deploy on us. So uh, we took a serious look at it and really refactored the program as it was. Now, um, because of the reInvent content lockdown, that 85 there is a little bit uh, off. It's now 93. So out of the uh, 130 services or so that are GA now, about 93 of them are HIPAA eligible. Again, they're listed on the webpage. I don't want to go through all of them, but you know, what we've been able to do is dramatically accelerate the program and accelerate the pace with which we are able to qualify services and bring them into eligible status. And I'll, uh, you know, want to touch on one more thing before I uh, get into more about what the BAA requires. Um, that HIPAA eligible status that we've been able to extend to things, um, you know, the, the nice thing about it has been that a number of services that you'll see uh, roll out into GA now, the program has reached the point where we are able to uh, bring things into eligible status upon release. Right? So as opposed to going back and, and uh, doing a lot of remediation work on services, we have now, you know, since identified the common control set that needs to be in place, identified the common requirements, implemented them in, as part of the minimum viable development process that we have, and then uh, rolling them out as eligible uh, upon GA. So a lot of the interesting services that you'll see this week, you know, that I'm not at liberty to mention right now, but um, some of them will be not all, but some of them will be GA upon release, or will be eligible upon GA release. 
So what does the BAA require? What do we really uh, you know, put out there? We boil it down to three essential requirements. The ability to trace all of your activity, to audit everything that you do. The ability to encrypt data, uh, well, sensitive data, so protected health information or personally identifiable information while at rest. And um, the ability to encrypt that same data while in transit. These are the essential things that we ask both of us to do, right? We ask you to do and we bring into our services. And we do so with the shared responsibility model in mind, right? This is something that we always kind of put forward, right? So for those of you not familiar, the shared responsibility model really kind of sets out our, our responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis security. And we are responsible for the security of the cloud and your responsibility for your security in the cloud. The you know, kind of closest analogy that I've you know, I've worked through a few. I, I don't think I've ever come up with anything, you know, so witty. It just explains the whole thing easily. Um, but a safety deposit box at a bank is very similar to this, right? And the bank is responsible for maintaining the integrity and security of that box while you're away. But you have the keys. You have the control of that box. You have access to the box. But only if you manage those keys appropriately, right? If somebody gets their hands on it and, and gets through it, it's possible for them to get into your safety deposit box if they were to compromise all the controls that you put in place. But the tools are there for you, right? And what we try to do is make sure that everybody understands how best to utilize those tools and what they need to do uh, as they do it. And we do that by aligning to the HIPAA security rule. Now, um, NIST 800-66 is the sort of resource guide that the National Institute of Standards and Technology introduces to explain a lot of the rule and what they expect for an implementation. The baseline controls are present in another resource that they present called NIST 853. These templates are available on AWS, and we have you know, links to various resources uh, available. Uh, but these templates are used as sort of the baseline for a lot of the architectures that we deploy on AWS. And for any HIPAA compliant environment that our customers ask for immediately, this, these are the, the templates that we begin from. So I'd encourage everybody to take a look at, at what's in there and Mithin will explain a little bit about some of the interesting things in those templates. Now I'm gonna read this from the whole thing. No, I, I just, you know, this is more of just a graphic and, and some of you may seem, uh, have seen some of this before uh, from some previous presentations at reInvent's past. But um, buried down in there in yellow is the call out within the security rule for the, the audit controls that you need to implement. And specifically, if we zoom in on it a little bit, um, the audit controls called for are really to just be able to ex record and examine all activity you know, that takes place. This is it, right? But it's, you know, it's, it's a blanket call for you to be able to you know, produce the results of any activity that has taken place uh, you know, within a, an application or architecture that you have deployed. And so you know, what needs to be noted here right, is that when the HIPAA security rule first rolled out many years ago, um, the Office of Civil Rights, the OCR, uh, didn't really do much about it. But then a few years ago has taken, sort of made a bit of a pivot and taken a change that now they uh, can do some proactive audits of your, uh, you know, deployed infrastructure where you're known to be handling sensitive data or patient data. And this is something that, you know, you want to make sure to uh, be aware of, right? Uh, you know, that you know, it's, it, they have certain requirements that they, or things that they expect to see. And the first one of those things is that you be able to determine the activities that will be tracked or audited. We say it's a blanket everything. And really the second thing is what tools will be used to support that audit, right? And these are services that we provide, but we need you to configure and enable and deploy. And let's go through a few of those right now. So everybody is probably familiar with you know, some of the basics with CloudTrail and AWS Config, CloudWatch, GuardDuty. We also have flow logs available to trace a lot of the activity within a, a network activity within a VPC. 
And you know, these are the common set of tools you should make sure to enable regardless of what you're, you're doing, right? And I would encourage you to um, you know, take a look at the templates that we have within this 800, 800 53 but also really um, you know, adopt them as part of your standard practice. I would encourage you to do that, you know, not just deploy them, but you know, configure and enable them properly. If you do so, right, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting things that you can do uh, when you select those tools, but also be able to bring them in for analysis on your own, right? And should you know, something unfortunate really happen, you now have the base data necessary to review or audit you know, that activity or malicious activity that's taken place, right? It's a safeguard for you. All right. The, the, a lot of, um, we get a lot of questions about the necessity or, or what's needed for encryption um, you know, or what HIPAA asks for with encryption. If you actually take a look through and, and dig through the entire thing and, you know, use some kind of actual search, you'll find the words encryption only really occur twice, and here they are. But what they asked for is, you know, a mechanism that's implemented to encrypt and decrypt electronic protected health information, right? They don't specify what encryption is necessary. They don't say anything about where you should keep the keys for that encrypted method, you know, encryption algorithm that you're using, anything about that. But, you know, primarily, you know, they, I think we have the guidance here, um, they ask for, you know, all that information to be rendered secure, protected, unusable, and unreadable indecipherable, and some HHS publications refer to that exactly. This is as detailed as they will get about that. Now, you know, I've had some, you know, the, the, the basic thing here is that uh, encryption by way of obscurity or, or just shuffling and hiding things away is probably not adequate, but it's hard to tell under the regulation. What we'd encourage you to do is to adopt sort of maximal encryption standards that are available, and that way you, you protect yourself for the future. So use a confidential process or key. Now, the, the thing to note with that is that the mechanisms are provided for, you know, for you within KMS, within some of the other utilities that we have, but you know, how you protect those keys, the process by which you protect those keys, the process by which you uh, keep them you know, secret to, you know, or limited to just the scope of people that need to see it or access it, that is up to you. Um, and you know, how the, you know, the policy by which you rotate those keys or take care of any kind of general access to them, again, uh, is something that you have to determine. But the tools are available for you to implement whatever process you would like. OK, now my colleague uh, Mithin will go through a few of the example architectures that we see and kind of common stuff that we encounter in this domain. Don't, don't. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, so we'll walk through some of the reference architectures, uh, which we will categorize in three categories. First, uh, we'll take the quick start, which uh, Patrick talked about, uh, based on the NIST uh, assurance framework. And then we'll look at uh, uh, some serverless topologies in which uh, we'll talk about how they can be leveraged for healthcare use cases. So this is the uh, quick start that we have from AWS, which you can download and run it on your environments, and it will build uh, a HIPAA-eligible uh, architecture for you uh, based on the, like it's, it's a three-tier web application architecture, which, which will provide you with uh, a management VPC and a production VPC. The idea being that the management VPC will provide you with the capability uh, to, uh, to administer uh, the workload that's deployed <coughs> on the production VPC. It provides you with the bastion host through which you can access. It will deploy the resources for the encrypted S3 bucket, which uh, will enable you to store any kind of uh, PHI data, uh, any web content, logging data, and so on, which needs to be product protected uh, for your uh, HIPAA eligibility. In addition to it, uh, the quick start will have uh, auto scaling as well as uh, the load balancers deployed on the public uh, uh, subnet, uh, allowing you to 
uh, auto scale and uh, provide access uh, with the right security groups for uh, accessing the applications. It also gives you the IAM roles, uh, the groups, uh, the permissions, and policies that will be pre configured for you. Uh, as I said, this is an architecture for a, a web application. However, you can always take this uh, application that's deployed and customize it for your own, own requirements. For example, I needed to take this base architecture and use it for uh, deploying an exchange server. One of the main issues that I ran into once this baseline was created was that there are ports that need to be opened for deploying the exchange server. And for that, I needed to uh, tweak the security groups because they are uh, restricted to the bare minimum uh, needed for deploying just the web application and accessing it on the required port. So that will be something that uh, you will find once you use the quick start. In addition to it, the databases, as you can see, are deployed in a, in a private subnet. Uh, it uses encryption uh, at rest, uh, as well as in transit for accessing the database. We have uh, the AWS config rules, CloudTrail, and CloudWatch alarms, uh, which Patrick talked about in reference to enabling the tracing, logging, and any kind of notification around, uh, let's say you have a situation where somebody is trying to create a, a new role uh, through IAM, or if there's a new key that has been created, the config rules and the CloudWatch alarms will make sure that a notification is triggered so that you know that any such activity has taken place. Uh, the S3 part of it, uh, as it shows that it, it, it is, uh, the encryption is enabled on that as well to protect the data. Now we move on to the, the conversational bots. So this is an example of a serverless scenario where uh, you want to take advantage of some of the non hip eligible services as well and build something which is more towards the serverless uh, patterns that you typically see. Uh, here, in this particular use case, I've taken a case for uh, using a service called Lex. Lex is not HIPAA eligible at this time. However, you can still take advantage of it uh, in the context of healthcare. For example, in this particular example, uh, it is being used to engage with patients. Uh, take, for example, a scenario where you want to uh, talk about uh, 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 or you want to engage patients to see if they may be interested in a certain new type of medication from a pharma company. In such a situation, Lex can be used to probably collect some kind of the condition information from that patient, uh, go and check uh, using a Lambda function, call a DynamoDB or an RDS to see if that particular set of conditions that the patient has provided will match up against something which is more relevant for that particular new drug that they're trying to uh, launch. And if so, uh, they can then uh, respond back to the to the patient and then use Amazon Connect, which is a, uh, which is a HIPAA eligible service, and that can then maybe go into a more personalized way of collecting information from the patient. Here, this is a classic case of a serverless web application. Uh, if uh, you're trying to build maybe a, a healthcare-based web app uh, and you want to take advantage of the serverless uh, uh, resources, uh, this shows a reference architecture where you're going using CloudFront, uh, API Gateway, and Lambda uh, to provide your compute resources. And then you use Amazon DynamoDB to store any kind of a PHI that may be required for uh, serving web content for this particular web application. We also have uh, the capability using the VPN-based services to connect to any kind of uh, on-premise uh, uh, service that may be there, which will provide you more details based on the use case that you're trying to build for that particular web application. Here's another use case where, uh, you, where you're leveraging mobile diagnostics. Uh, the use of variables as it gains more and more adoption in the healthcare space, it's very common that you know customers will want to take advantage of it. In this particular reference architecture, uh, we are showing how you can use a mobile device, uh, collect uh, data, telemetry data using that, over uh, using Amazon Cognito, CloudFront, API Gateway, and Lambda. Again, all these are HIPAA eligible services, and that can in turn connect with, uh, with uh, DynamoDB. 
Uh, this in turn, again, you can have a web application connected to it from where a user can monitor any kind of data that has been collected using the variables that the patient is using. With this, I'll hand it over to Phil. He'll talk about some of the networking-related use cases he's seen for his customers. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Mitchell. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Phil. Uh, I'll be talking about some of the things that, uh, that my organization, LogicWorks, has encountered as we've gone through the process of both building HIPAA-compatible uh, architectures for our customers and also migrating existing HIPAA uh, workloads into the cloud. One of the things that is always the promise of, uh, of, of a HIPAA workload is that we achieve a, a set of basic configurations. As, as Pat was saying earlier, everything kind of breaks down to a handful of, of specific areas. And, and specifically, the ones I'm focusing on here is that in addition to logging and audits, we also have an encryption requirement. And this encryption requirement is at play in literally everything we do in the environment because we want to be using encryption both when we uh, have a connection to the actual public facing resource we might be hosting but also for any communication that's happening within our internal network. Um, but uh, when we really look at the issues that we run into uh, with, with different customers, particularly legacy customers migrating to the cloud, the biggest area that we run into problems is around the issue of encryption in transit and properly applying SSL in a way that still allows you to achieve some of the promises of AWS around elasticity, reliability, and redundancy. Now, why do we have these kinds of issues? Now, this is just a theory I've started putting together, but uh, I think it really comes down to a conflict between the way in which uh, AWS achieves this promise of elasticity and a legacy issue that our predecessors really never solved, which is the idea of static IPs. Because we've got this huge DNS infrastructure, right, that has been around for as long as the internet, or at least as long as we've been working with the internet, and yet many times our uh, applications or other services make an assumption that once we look up an IP address, uh, that it's going to be that same address forever. And I, I think that many of the issues we run into at a legacy conversion level, or even if we're just trying to take some of the things that we know about uh, you know, a, a physical infrastructure and apply them to the cloud, this is where I feel like people often run into issues. So um, what we're going to go do, we're going to do is we're going to go through some of the common network issues that you would go into when you're doing a typical HIPAA website stack. Now, for, for the sake of discussion, this is going to be a real simple website, but we'll just make the assumption that it has PHI on it, and we want to make sure we encrypt it properly. Now, typically, when we build a typical website and we're going to leverage all the elasticity functions that AWS provides, we're going to start by deploying a number of web resources. Let's just say we want to take advantage of three availability zones, so we're going to set up three instances. So the first thing that we have to deal with is how do we actually get the traffic into that environment? Um, what I've indicated here is I've got a, a simple VPC architecture where I've got three public subnets which allow for normal uh, connectivity to the public internet, and then three private subnets where I want to keep all of my most important resources. Um, but you know, where do I go from here? Now, normally our first step is we're going to take the uh, the application load balancer, and we're going to put one of those in the public subnets, and we're going to allow that to connect internally to our web instances in our private subnets. There's some challenges here, though, when we're dealing with a legacy environment. Um, but you know, I'm not going to get into that just yet. Let me just talk about a couple other parts of this. The next thing we're going to do, of course, is we're going to have some kind of uh, database instance. We'll assume that we're going to use an RDS multi-AZ pair. Of course, again, this is all internal, so we have a little more control over how we connect to it, and it's a little bit easier to ensure that we're using SSL uh, and for encryption in transit. We're probably going to want to add some kind of cache, maybe to control our session caching. And of course, this can also be a, a multi-AZ deployment, right? So in in a, a typical cloud-first architecture, this is, this is where we end up. Very quickly, we have a very simple yet very uh, you know, secure method for hosting a website uh, on AWS. The problem is that oftentimes our customers may have even more requirements that maybe we, didn't, we don't necessarily think of on a regular basis. And the biggest one comes with, uh, with healthcare and other uh, you know, particularly risk-averse companies. They often will have uh, outbound firewalls. Outbound firewalls that say, oh, our people, our staff can only access the following IP addresses. 
Well, this is where we run into that elasticity problem again, because when we're deploying an application load balancer or its predecessor, the classic ELB, we're making a promise. We're saying, anytime someone's going to look up the IP address of our web service, we're going to actually query this DNS address that corresponds to that load balancer, and we're gonna get back a couple of different addresses, but there's no promise that those addresses are going to stay the same. And in fact, as you get increasingly large amounts of traffic, excuse me, increasingly large amounts of traffic, you're going to add additional IPs that will be returned by that result. And as you scale back down, some of those IPs will disappear. So we can't make any assumptions that those are gonna be there forever. So this is where we run into the reality. You know, everybody likes to think like, well, we've got all these tools at our disposal. It's, it's gotta be easy for us to put together a workload like this. Well, unfortunately, as we know, reality often has other plans. So what are some of the legacy issues we run into? Well, I've touched on one already, the idea of a legacy firewall. Rather than having something like an outbound squid proxy or some kind of uh, more managed service for outbound access, we maybe just have a very uh, simple firewall that only allows us to allow access or deny access via IP ranges. That's very difficult if the IPs that are coming back from your load balancer could be all over the IP space that Amazon owns. There's also problems with people who are following old uh, resolution methods. I haven't actually narrowed down explicitly where this comes from, but a couple of different uh, platforms, there's, there's some Java platforms I run into and some Windows platforms that seem to have a, a, a strange habit of caching IPs. Like after it looks up a DNS record, it will cache that IP and not try to look it up again, regardless of what the TTL is that's established on that DNS record. Uh, this is a problem, of course, if you're counting on the elasticity features of AWS. We can also have problems with monolithic applications. When reporting these things to a highly available deployment, uh, this is something I see a lot with some of the some legacy Java applications that use a in-memory session database. We have this scenario where we're counting on all of our session cookies that are coming into that website to be able to be looked up in memory. Well, that doesn't work very well when you've got three different or more app, uh, uh, instances running behind the scenes. And then we also have issues with, with old security standards around SSL. Uh, one of the things that is a real standard part of SSL now and has been for five or 10 years is the idea of server name indication. This is a, uh, the, the contemporary way that we deal with the fact that we might want to host a number of different SSL hosted certificates and sites on a single IP address or a potentially a, a single variably changing IP address. Uh, so all these things can be addressed with the tools that AWS provides, but it may not be immediately obvious the best way to deal with some of these legacy challenges. So there's a few anti-patterns that people might follow to try to address this. One would be to rather than using the, the elastic load balancer, the application load balancer, to use the NLB. This is a, a released in the last year or so, a service that allows us to have static uh, elastic IPs associated with each subnet that we wanna put our load balancer in, and then it will take care of doing the appropriate routing to those items internally. The problem with this is one that we've, we first of all have, we don't have a lot of options to scale at that network load balancer level because just the way the NLB is architected, it's not really meant to, uh, to, to dynamically scale sort of these number of instances and so forth that it's actually running it on. But additionally, some of the things it does while transforming the source IP address can become challenges for uh, applications that need to know the, uh, the origin IP address of a customer connecting to it. We also can, uh, there's, there's some scenarios where people will do things, as I mentioned, these caching lookups, this idea that, well, we'll just have a, a record maybe that just returns all of the available instances that we have in our environment. Now, of course, it would end up, means that our, our environment would look something like this where we use no load balancing. And so this is a scenario where, yes, this would work. We could have uh, an A record in DNS that would return three different IPs corresponding to these instances, but now we've taken our EC2 instances and put them in a public space, so they've got that much more exposure to the public internet. Uh, so you know, what are our options here? Well, it ends up that there's a real trick that we can follow, and we can get all of the things that we want by leveraging two pieces of the AWS infrastructure. That's that 
ingress around this network load balancer and then using our internal ELB in HTTPS mode to take care of some of the basic assumptions that we make when we're dealing with a web app. So, uh, you know, just a real quick summary. It's, this is things like adding the X forwarded for header, ensuring that we are clear about whether the connection happened over HTTPS or not, so we can appropriately do redirects and things of this nature. So once we have this together, it seems fairly straightforward. We've got a network load balancer, and we just need to have it redirect to those various internal IPs in the internal ALB. However, there's still a challenge there as well because we need to make sure that there's a way to keep all that up to date. So I'm gonna get into the later half of this discussion, I'm gonna get into a specific solution that we've had and we also have some uh, cloud formation that you guys can download and experiment with by yourself. So what's another scenario that we might run into though if we have a complicated certificate requirement? This is taking that previous example I just gave and this is a, a real life example that we had with a customer who hosts uh, thousands, I think they have 10,000 right now and they wanna go up to 30,000 different sites, all SSL encrypted for various customers. And basically the challenge here was they wanted a dedicated certificate for each one. And you know, real quickly, even before you get to 10,000 certificates, uh, you're gonna run into problems trying to run those all directly on an ALB. Uh, I think an ALB will let you have up to 25 certificates uh, and I think you can potentially get that raised but it's always a real challenge. This allows us to sort of take the best of both worlds. So what we did is we created, again we start with our network load balancer but rather than having it go to a ALB instance, we have a tier of HA proxy instances that are able to make use of, I touched on it real briefly, this idea of server name indication. Server name indication basically passes the host name of the site you're connecting to as part of the SSL negotiation. This allows your server to actually determine which certificate that it actually needs to use to protect that connection. So basically that's what we do, is we have a uh, collection of SSL certificates that correspond to the actual host name that the person's gonna connect to, and when HA Proxy sees that SNI server uh, flag, it's able to select the right IP and then we have an additional challenge though because we wanna make sure we can still achieve uh, high availability and scalability through the rest of the environment. Because if we go straight from HA proxy, the question is how do we tell HA proxy all the instances in our web group if we're using an auto-scaling group? If our, auto -sc if our web group could potentially have 10, 20, 30 instances in it, how do we make sure that uh, HA proxy knows where to send it? And basically, there's, there's a lot of internal things that you could do to make this be handled directly by HA proxy, but we just take the tools that we have and we use the classic ELB. It's one of the things that uh, oftentimes people say, well, why is the classic ELB still here if we've got the ALB and it has so many better features? This is one of the reasons. With the internal ELB, we can put this in uh, TCP only mode is going to pass through that encrypted traffic right from, uh, from our HA proxy instance and land on our web server. So what we get in this scenario is we get through the NLB, we get static IPs so that the customers can properly whitelist these in their firewall. Through the HA proxy tier, we get the necessary uh, certificates so we can have a ridiculous, well, potentially ridiculous number of certificates available and functional as part of this single endpoint. And then finally, we leverage the internal ELB to add the additional uh, you know, flexibility and elasticity that we require at that level. So then, just a little bit about how this solution is going to work. This is sort of uh, the, the inbound process we touched on. You know, we come in through our network load balancer. So however many availability zones we have, that's the number of IP addresses that will potentially need to be whitelisted in the customer's uh, firewall. Then after the network load balancer, we manage to connect to the uh, various IP addresses that make up the ALB. And then eventually from there, the ALB can do whatever kind of normal routing that it wants to do. The question here though is, how do we do this in a way that really keeps this fully integrated? And so this is where we get into the solution that LogicWorks has created. Uh, this is based on uh, a really great blog that was published on the AWS blog uh, that talks about some of these exact same challenges that we're running into here. And so there's a few things that we need to start with. The assumption is that we've got a VPC architecture, of course, and then we've got some kind of internal application load balancer that's fronting whatever the, the resources are that we wanna to provide to the public internet in a static way. We have three elastic IPs that associate, or however many, uh, that we associate with our network load balancer. 
And then we have a target group of these internal IPs that make up the actual instances that correspond to our load balancer. So how do we keep this all up to date? How do we connect all these things together so that we're not constantly making updates to our network load balancer, or our target groups, according to these various changes that are happening to our infrastructure? And the key is Lambda. It's a perfect task for Lambda because what we really need to do, and there's, there's a few different options we're actually looking at to expand upon this now that some uh, recent features have been added to AWS config. But what this is basically going to do is periodically query the internal IP address, the internal DNS name of our internal load balancer. It's gonna get back that list of IPs. And then it's got a couple of uh, options here to preserve state in an S3 bucket and publish metrics to CloudWatch. But at the end of the day, what our Lambda function is doing is updating our load balancer's target group with all the various uh, IP addresses that make up our internal ALB. So through this process, and again, we're gonna be uh, giving you a, a sample cloud formation here that you could use to try this out yourself, we can again provide all these same elasticity features through uh, the, uh, in, and still achieve all the same legacy requirements that we might have put on us from particular uh, organizations or requirements. So um, real quick, I want to put this up. Uh, if you guys take a picture or what have you of, of this, this is our, our specific uh, CloudFormation solution to create a static ALB. So if you already have an internal, e uh, internal ALB deployed, this will deploy all the necessary resources around that so that you can uh, achieve the same sort of static standards deployment in your own environment. Um, but this is about it for me, so thanks very much, and I'm gonna just pass back to Pat here to close out our discussion. Thanks, Phil. That's awesome. Thank you. So as always, uh, we really appreciate you being here. I hope you have a wonderful reInvent. And if you see any of us in the halls, I will uh, be happy to talk with any of you. And get your session survey in the mobile app. Take care.